John, as I told you, as we were prepping for this, uh, we give everyone a couple of minutes to uh, to go ahead and jump in. So if you guys are early, everyone welcome to the show. We've got John on to help us kind of finish the, what we'll call it a, a very broad skater discussion. I think when we started this five or six weeks ago, when Vlad pitched me the theme, we're like, yes, it is going to be very specific to skater. And it is just kind of ballooned from skater, everything above skater. And now we're talking about skater data and, uh, and everything from that point uh so we'll let everyone uh, go ahead and jump in while we do this uh as everyone knows i've got a couple of announcements as as we get ready to uh to go in so vlad and i have uh this show and then two more left over the course of this year we are actively planning and putting themes and other things together for 2023 if you guys have an awesome theme that we should take a look at please let us know uh we've got kind of a whole bunch of pencil marked ends but if we have missed something uh this year last year um and you guys want to make sure that we hit it going forward please feel free to uh, to go ahead and drop us a note uh I absolutely love everyone's thoughts and ideas I will also say so IIoT world uh is I guess we're technically finishing the uh, the event tomorrow. I am on at 11 o'clock East Coast time uh, talking about making data make sense in 2023, which I, I think is going to uh, to work very well with, with the conversation uh, that we're having today. And then if you haven't gotten enough of me, you guys can check me out on Sam Gupta's channel where we're talking all about rework and manufacturing to go finish his digital transformation series uh, for the for the 2022 year, which is always uh, which is always a good time. It is, uh, I don't know, probably the easiest hour of my week as I get to go be the OT guy who fights fights against a whole bunch of IT folks and ERP people who uh, who may or may not have ever done any rework uh, in, in their entire lives. So I, I always have a good time. It is it is always fun to uh, to go hang out and uh, and get in that chat. Um beyond that before we jump in, I do want to say Hello to everyone from Solus PLC. So, John, you may or may not know that, that Vlad runs Solus PLC. Uh, they've almost cracked 35,000 subscribers. They were at 34,900 and some and change earlier today when I checked them out. We always get at least a couple hundred viewers uh, from those guys. And so we always like to say hi. Thank everyone for watching. If you guys have not uh, subscribe to Solos PLC's YouTube, please go ahead and do that because one, you get to see, well, me talk about this every week, Wednesday around this time, but two, we get to help push Vlad, uh, Vlad and Solos PLC towards the 100,000 subscriber mark. Plus, I have said if Vlad doesn't want to ask people to subscribe, we as the rest of Manufacturing Hub get to take all credit for his subscribers. So we, Thank the you, Royal, absolutely, Vlad, we, we get to take uh, what our friends for if not to take credit for all of your hard work and success. Uh, without further ado, let, let's go ahead and jump on. Uh, everyone, welcome to Manufacturing Hub. I am Dave. This guy up here is Vlad. We are very happy to welcome our special guest, John Harrington, uh, on this week. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Vlad. Excited to be here. Appreciate you joining us today, John. Uh, before we dive into the technical aspects of SCADA, data, and everything in between, could we get a little introduction of your background? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So I am the uh, chief product officer at HiBite and one of the co-founders. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk more about HiBite um, in a few minutes. But uh, my background, I have a mechanical engineering uh, undergrad and always loved manufacturing, always loved how to put things together, how to design things and how to do things at scale. Um, spent most of my career working in technology for manufacturing. So worked in CAD industry, PLM industry, um, project management, got into, uh, spent some time, a few years, five years in manufacturing. And then um, most recently prior to HiBite, I spent eight years at Kepler Technologies, uh, leading the, the um, product management team. And then, uh, of course, they got acquired by PTC, uh, stayed there for a couple of years, and then uh, left, joined up with a few of my former colleagues, and we founded uh, HiBite. Awesome. If I can, I guess, dig in a little bit on the product management side for I want to say personal reasons a little bit, but just trying to understand, you know, having a, a background on the mechanical side, was there like a transition? Was it, you know, something that you wanted to take up on yourself to, uh, because again, like PTC, I guess is primarily a software 
uh, oriented service. What was maybe that that learning curve like, or what did you have to uh, figure out to be efficient uh, in that role? No, it's it's a great question, and and I think part of it is you know how do I see product management, and um, I see product management as kind of in a company they often are the piece that binds the engineering team with the marketing team, with the selling team and with the customers. And so we um, generally understand the customer base very well and what they would want to do with the technology and then use that knowledge to work with marketing on how do we communicate that out, work with sales on, on kind of coming in and supporting their conversations with customers and work with the engineering team on what do we need to add to the technology in the future. So You know, my background being a mechanical engineer, working in a manufacturing company, I understand the customer. And that's what I always felt was really important is you have to understand the customer. You have to understand, you know, the perspective that they're coming at it from. And then you have to be really curious. It's all about being curious. It's all about asking questions. It's all about being vulnerable enough to ask questions um, when you don't understand things because in technology, things are constantly changing. Um, And then, you know, using an engineering mindset to kind of formulate ideas on how how we can support them better, how we can solve their problems and what sort of technology we need to do that. And then working with all the other resources, because at the end of the day, we do a lot of talking and writing and formulating of ideas, but not a lot of kind of I don't write code and I don't sell and I don't actually, you know. I go out and talk to a lot of people, but but I'm not doing a lot. But what I'm doing is kind of guiding a lot. Yeah, that I think it it explains a lot. But I guess I'm curious, you know, how the idea for High Byte came to be, right? So after you, um, I guess parted ways with Kepware, uh, yeah. you mentioned a little bit off stream that you started looking for an interesting idea. You obviously have a really good pulse on the market but I'm assuming there was still some process of figuring out what that next idea or maybe business venture would be. I'm really curious, like on the process of how high bite came to be. And I guess maybe, maybe, sorry, like let's take a step back. Could you, could you give us a synopsis of what high bite is so that people know uh, what the idea is before we get on how it came to be? Sure. Um, so high bite as a company is a software company supplying technologies to the manufacturing, or I'll call it industrial companies, be it manufacturing, power and utilities, um, supply chain, all those sort of industries. Um, And we're, um, we call it industrial data ops. So the delivery of data and the curation of data for, you know, today it's all about analytics and dashboards and, and data lakes and how can we deliver information to the people that need it. So we're, think of us as a middleware. We're an infrastructure play, delivering data, collecting data from different systems, packaging it up and delivering it to where it needs to go. And I can talk more in depth on that, but let me answer your first question, which is how did High Bike get started? Um, the interesting thing is, you know, I, <clears throat> I left um, Kepware or PTC at that point. Um, I, was, I, was, uh, I was a little bit burnt out at that point. I needed a break. Um, PTC's headquarters were about two hours away from, from where I live. And so I was doing a lot of commuting down there. Um, they've got a great team, a great company, but in order to really progress myself, I would have had to have lived, uh, down in Massachusetts. I didn't want to do that. I lived, I grew up in Portland, Maine. I lived outside for a while. I moved back for a reason. So I left and I, I took a little bit of time off and I started to think about what, what I wanted to do next. Um, interestingly, At the same time, a few other key managers from Kepware also had left um, within kind of a three, four month time period. So that summer we got together and said, you know, we really enjoyed working together. And and we think there's still a lot of problems with industrial data. In fact, the problems are growing because all we kept hearing about was um, IoT and analytics and all of that. So this is uh, summer of 2018. IoT analytics, it's not scaling, it's a problem. The problem is with the, you know, everyone is solving it at the analytic or at the IoT platform. And um, so we said, you know, it sounds like we understand technology. We've been at Kepware. Um, One of the the people that I, so the the two other founders of HiBite was Tony Payne, who's the former CEO of Kepware 
had been there for 20 years, had started as a software architect. He loves to write code. His happy place is writing code, though he was the CEO of the company and he's run a, you know, a large company um, that's done very well. Um, the other person was to Tori Penrod Canberra. Tori uh, led marketing for Kepware, also had been there for many years. Um, so the three of us had worked together. We knew each other. We'd been through a lot together. And we said, let's get back together and see what we can do. So we formed Highbyte without fully knowing what the solution would be. And then Tony spent the first three to six months doing a lot of prototyping and, and looking at technology. What technology platform should we be developing on? How should we be thinking about things? What's new? What's going on? Um, I spent that time really focusing on the market. What's the market doing? Where are the problems? Interviewing system integrators, end users, anyone that would talk to me. Um, in fact, probably some of your listeners uh, talked to me in the early days and couldn't really understand what I was talking about. But, uh, you know, and then we started developing code and, and um, Tony was developing code and I was uh, putting together what we needed and writing um, white papers and uh, putting together articles and all that kind of thing and really focused in on, um, you know, the main thesis was um, data for industry 4.0 was broken and we need to come up with a better solution. And we really need to, um, we need some, some middleware that really uh, abstracts the contextualization and standardization of data away from all the applications. So if you look at a lot of analytics applications, they all have some level of kind of modeling and data transformation at them. Well, if you only are gonna have one, then you can do it there. But if you're gonna have five or 10 or whatnot, and a lot of them come from the IT space, not the OT space, you really need some other solution to be managing all that data and the movement of that data and, and maintaining it. And so we, that's, kind of the primary thesis is the way to accelerate the delivery of IoT and analytics and cloud and everything else um, is by having a, a data management solution. And that's that's what we've delivered. We call it industrial data ops. I'm curious, John, on, on, on that description, you know, like the initial, I want to say like conversations, were they revealing maybe if, if that pain point is present across the entire industry, if there was maybe like a specific industry that was lagging behind a little bit more than the other. Uh, again, me coming from food and beverage, I, I feel like that pro problem is certainly present there. And there's a lot of, well, I guess like uncertainty on how it's going to be solved. And I, I really hope that High Bite addresses that need in that specific market. But I'm wondering is it the same, you know, for oil and gas? Is it the same in, in pharma? Is it slightly different between, you know, the sizes of the companies? Like, I, I'm just curious, you know, what your kind of initial conversations at that point revealed. Yeah, so um, the initial conversations were that there was definitely a problem. And, you know, one of the key things that I keyed in on is um, where you have a lot of custom code, there's an opportunity for a solution. And so when I started talking with people and they said, well, you know, we've got a bunch of custom code to get data into their SCADA system. And then they've got a bunch of custom code to pull it out and do some transformations on it and deliver it up to the cloud or deliver it to this dashboard or deliver it to Tableau or Power BI. And at every step along the path, we've got some custom code to consume, like everything has an API today, but you still have to wire up the APIs and you still have to do some data transformations in order to make the data fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. and, and often data for a dashboard or Power BI, you're pulling it from multiple sources. So you need to, to uh, interlace it or you need to um, align it and merge it together um, intelligently in order to do that. So, so we found, you know, so custom code was kind of one of those things where I said, well, custom code is great for prototyping and it's great when things are static. And so 20 years ago was fine for linking up systems, especially like a SCADA system, because things were static, but things aren't static anymore. Um, the problems that people are trying to solve are rapidly changing. Our, our world is changing. Our, um, our product lines are changing much faster than they used to. And as a result, we need much more agility 
and that's where solutions come into play in my eyes. You know, being in the software industry for since I dare to say 1994, um, that's where solutions play is when, mm -hmm. when you need a, a software application to manage and maintain um, information or to deliver it. So, you know, I, we, we took that approach. When it comes to different industries, <clears throat> we found that it was kind of everywhere, but we didn't have a very good sample because when you start just calling people up, you'll talk to anyone and you didn't really focus on one industry over another. My background is certainly much more on the, the uh, discrete and batch mm -hmm. side versus the process side, the oil and gas or, or chemicals. Um, since then, I'll tell you it's everywhere. Uh, Highlight has customers on the discrete side, everything from um, auto to tier one to you know, uh, luxury goods to um, industrial goods, industrial products. On the batch side, the steel companies, um, uh, pulp and paper, um, pharmaceuticals, food and beverage. We have customers in the process side in oil and gas, um, energy side, renewables, um, power companies. So really broad based um, across the industrial space is really where we're focused. But it's, it's kind of, you know, as a founder, it's great when you look at your customer base and it's broad like that. Now, we're really focused on the larger companies. Um, the smaller companies tend to run their entire business with one application. And when you have that one application, then you're, you're stuck with, does that application have the data that we need? And all I need to do is pull it out of that. So, so you probably wouldn't need a solution like, like HiBuy. Um, when you have multiple applications, multiple departments of people who want to get access to data, you're using a lot of these new modern tools like AI and data lakes and cloud and dashboards and whatnot. That's when um, people tend to use us. So we tend to deal with more of the uh, <clears throat> larger companies uh, in manufacturing power utilities. Gotcha. John, we have a question from the comments uh, on LinkedIn. So Robert is asking, when you talk about delivering data for industrial control systems, what type of data? And maybe, I don't know if you have like an example, obviously, without mentioning like a customer name, but my assumption, and I've seen the tool, but fairly briefly, but you can connect to various PLC brands. You can siphon out pretty much like any data that is defined inside of a PLC. And I guess not to maybe dive into the features, but ultimately you can talk to PLCs, yeah. you can talk to IPCs. Uh, right. I'm assuming, could you give us a synopsis maybe of, uh, of what that data is and what's commonly used? Absolutely. Um, and I also want to clarify. So, so we're not trying to sit between the SCADA and the devices um, for the most part. We generally sit. Um, so first thing, when I look at the ISA 95 stack, right, I think that it's a well-defined stack of applications though a lot of those layers are getting split up into multiple applications today. Mm -hmm. um, when I think of moving data, that's where I think that, that, that the Purdue model or the ISA stack kind of falls apart because I think that there's too much data to move it up the layers one after another. And that you have to think about communications or movement of data as a different dimension to it. And so, you have to be able to pull data out of the SCADA system, potentially off of a sensor, potentially out of the PLC, out of the MES, out of the ERP, all layers, potentially pull the data out of those systems, pack it together and deliver it to wherever it needs to go uh, mm -hmm. for the end user. So we talk with control systems, um, we talk with PLCs, uh, we talk with sensors. So how do we do that? We, we can support MQTT, we can support Spark Plug B over MQTT. When I say MQTT, I generally think of JSON payloads over standard MQTT. Um, but Spark Plug B as well. Um, we have a we do have a Modbus connector. It's primarily for pulling data out of sensors. A lot of these sensor gateways are now supporting Modbus. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have OPC UA, so we can connect to Capware, of course, Ignition, um, any other OPC UA uh, server out there and pull data from them. We can connect over SQL. Um, so any sort of SQL database, Microsoft SQL, uh, MySQL, Postgres, 
Um, we can connect to ERP systems over REST or any system over REST. We also have a connector specifically for InfluxDB and for OSI Pi. And then we have connectors up to the cloud vendors. Um, so, so AWS and Azure, lots of different services we support, like seven different services in AWS. Um, I think we support four or five of them in Azure. Um, so lots of options there. And then I guess the last one is we can connect just to files. We can pick up and move image files. We can also pick up uh, CSV or Parquet files and interpret them and then move the data. So lots of different interfaces, but um, if you're just going SCADA directly down to your devices, um, it, it, we, we wouldn't be a good fit there. We generally aren't attacking that market. I think, you know, like Ignition, Ignition Edge to a device, keep that where it is. When you want to pull that data out and you want to leverage that outside of, a lot of our use cases are outside of the, the OT domain. Though some of them are still in the OT domain, a lot of them are outside and they're solving problems like the maintenance team needs access for predictive asset maintenance, need access to data, right? So I need access to, uh, we're going to put a vibration sensor on that pump and we're going to look at the vibration. Well, that was kind of preventive maintenance 1.0. Um, preventive maintenance 2.0 is, you know, I really need more than just the sensor data. I need to know the, the, the physical dynamics of what's going on around that machine. So are we, is the pump on? Is the valve on? Are we telling the pump that we need XPSI or are we, is it in a standby mode? Uh, knowing those, those system dynamics coupled with the vibration makes it far more valuable. Mm -hmm. Then when you're analyzing across an enterprise, across, you know, 50 or 500 pumps in my one factory and I've got 10 factories, you want to know who's the manufacturer of that pump. Mm -hmm. What's the size of that pump? Well, that's all in a CMMS system or an asset maintenance system. So being able to pull data from different systems together and then deliver that. In many cases, people are pushing it into either a data lake or database or influx or different systems so that they can do that analysis for predictive asset maintenance. So, so that's where we see a lot of opportunities. So asset maintenance, quality analysis, a lot of lines um, that we see, they've got quality systems typically at the end of a line, right? This says, is this a good part? Is this a bad part? Is this a good batch? Is it a bad batch? We see it in discrete, um, you know, tier one automotive. We see it in pharmaceutical. We see it in steel. Uh, steel and pharma, they sometimes even pull that sample out and they put it somewhere else into the lab and they test it the next day. And so the challenge is how do we align that, that lab data with the process data that was, that was collected and used while we were manufacturing that batch? And so a lot of times we have to go back into the historian in the MES system to pull that data out when the lab data shows up and then publish that up into wherever it's going. So, so uh, maintenance, quality, supply chain, R&D, sustainability, regulatory, energy management, you know, the, the list goes on and on. I always say it's, it's problems we've all been trying to solve for 20, 30, 50, 100 years in manufacturing but we're getting better and better and we're able to solve it at a much broader scale. It used to be, if you wanted quality data, you would send an engineer down onto the line and they would have a clipboard and they would you know, keep track of how many rejects do we have. Mm -hmm. Now we can monitor all of the machines in our entire factory and all the machines in every factory by one engineer sitting at his desktop because we can get them the data that they need. So, so it's just, it's really about, a lot of it is about scale. It's about getting data at a much higher resolution. It's about getting broader samples of data. Dave, what are your thoughts? I know that you've been quiet a little bit. <laughs> well, I, I certainly have many more questions, but uh, want to no, allow you no, to No, no, Vlad, in. I was going to say, I, I'm going to steal your line and say I have so many questions. So th th <laughs> this is this is typically a Vlad line on my manufacturing hub bingo, but I'm going to I'm going to steal it today. So so so, John, I, I guess the the biggest question that I have, which is probably very difficult to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway, is the idea of taking all of these disparate systems, you know, five, 10 systems at one facility, uh, looking at it across 10 different facilities that in an ideal world all have the same systems, but in reality don't have the same systems and 
pumping it up to we'll just call it the cloud to give us the single pane of glass right Th that that is the goal to give the ceo the the five pieces of contextual data that they need and the director of ops and, and all of the ops people with what they need and be everyone can go drill in as, as deep as they want how how easy or how difficult is that in reality um it's 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 uh it's what we're solving. Okay. And it's, you're right. Each, each uh, site has different systems. And even if they have the same system, talk to mm -hmm. people who say, we've got one at 10 different sites. It was implemented differently at every single one of them. Every right? time. Operations, OT technology was generally implemented uniquely at that site based mm -hmm. on the needs. And some yep. of those uniquenesses are very, are needed. And some mm -hmm. of them are just because it was a different engineer. Yep. Um, and we even see within a single factory, sometimes you have one engineer who was focused in one area, one engineer focused in another, and they just use different nomenclature, different naming mm -hmm. standards, different approaches. Um, there just weren't a lot of standards built in. And we didn't need them because mm -hmm. all that data was just going to SCADA or was yep. just going to MES. And if it's mm -hmm. just going to one target, you fix it there. Mm -hmm. And especially if that one target is owned by the person that kind of created the problem in the first place. Yep. So they go and they program their PLCs. They then go into SCADA. They know it all in their head. They do the mappings that they need to do. And voila, it's all there. And, and life was good. And, and that worked really well. The challenge that they didn't anticipate is that now we're pulling that data out and we're sending it somewhere else. We're delivering it to a user who has no idea what a Modbus um, data tag is, registry number is, let alone even like a, 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 a Rockwell or an Allen Bradley data data tag or you know whatnot. They don't know all those. They don't know how one pump is interrelated to another pump or to a valve or any of that structure. And they don't want to know that. Mm -hmm. What they want to know is, is this pump going to fail? or what's causing this quality defect. And that's their job. So, so we're pulling it out of that domain. We're giving it to those people um, wherever they are. And um, so that there's work there, but it's mm -hmm. a lot easier than it ever used to be. And we have people saying, you know, I used to get a request um, to solve a problem for one of my departments and it would take me a couple of months. Mm -hmm. And now, especially once I've got things installed and I've got some connectivity already set up in Hybite, I can do it in half a day yeah. because I can go in and I can find the data that they need and this data mm -hmm. here and this data there and this data there. And I'm going to package it up in this way and I'm going to standardize it in this way and I'm going to deliver it. So, you know, it's far faster and far more efficient than it ever used to be. Okay. Now, for you to say, how long does it take? And it's, it's always... What's the scope of the project, right? Yep. And we always say, um, you need to put in infrastructure for the vision, but you need to solve problems for today. So, mm -hmm. so you use your vision to describe where you need infrastructure, where you need technology, but ultimately we need to solve problems. And so, you know, we start picking it off. You said the CEO needs this dashboard, okay? What's the dashboard? What's the data? Where can we source that data? How do we need to transform it in order to get to the target? Um, quality engineer needs to solve these problems. What systems does a quality engineer work in? One of the big things, so industry 4.0 in my eyes is about delivering data to the enterprise. Mm -hmm. Industry 3.0 is about automating the factory. 4.0 is about delivering data to the enterprise so that they could be more efficient, more capable, more innovative, more agile, than they've ever been able to be. And that means delivering data to lots of different departments, right? All those use cases that I mentioned are different departments. You have to deliver the data to them where they are. Mm -hmm. I can't give them a new system. I need to give them data in the systems that they already use or the ones that IT uses to deliver information to them. So, um, you know, you're, you're delivering data to people where they are and you're delivering it curated for them. So it's, whereas industry 3.0, the big challenge, and in fact, Kepworth looked to solve this challenge. It was about sourcing the data 
Mm-hmm. Industry 4.0 is about delivering the data. It's about the target. It's about who needs it, what's it for, and what do they need? And the focus is on where the data is going, not where it's coming from. Um, so that, you know, that's been one of our learnings over time is you got to start with the end. What are you trying to solve for problems? It's not, I need 750,000 data tags in the cloud. Mm-hmm. It's, I need to do predictive asset maintenance. I need to do OEE on my line. I need mm-hmm. to do uh, SPC on my line. I need mm-hmm. to do um, process, I'm doing a, you know, a, a, a lean project mm-hmm. and I need to collect data in this section of, of, or this work cell, collect that data and start figuring out where we're losing time or what's going on. So, so it's about starting with that end and then working your way back. I love that. Uh, Vlad may or may not be shaking his head because that sounds like <laughs> literally words that, that have come out of my mouth, uh, maybe slightly different words that have come out of my mouth, but 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 I, I love that, John. Uh, there are tons of questions, and I appreciate all the questions we've got going in chat that, that I can see. Uh, we will do our best to kind of answer them as we get through this, but but Huck actually has a question. Um, that, that, that I have I a think... question for you, Dave, before you okay. give me that one. Okay. Should I be monitoring the questions and is there a link that I should be monitoring them? Cause right now I'm just going to take them all from you. I, I, I you, you listen to us. We will ask you the questions. Awesome. We, will sh- we will shoot you the event link when we're done because <laughs> there, w- there will be questions that we do not get to. Uh, when we get super technical in the weeds, uh, we, we typically don't get to them as longtime listeners of the show. No, uh, but, but we, we will absolutely get you to the event and, and all of the questions that we do not, uh, we do not get to, but so, so Huck, Huck has got a question yeah. and, and he says that he loves the opportunity that, that, that high bite enables. How do you get the engineering done to model the context that creates the value? Um, how do we get the engineering done? So, yeah. so HiBite is a software application. Mm-hmm. And um, within it, you can define connections to different systems. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to do any programming. We can mm-hmm. form a connection to a REST API or to a SQL database or to an okay. OPC server. Um, or to MQTT and we can collect data um, and we create inputs and know that's the data coming in. Um, you also create outputs and that's where it's going. So where, you know, we're sending it to Azure, we're sending it to AWS. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of our customers are sending it to one of those two. Uh, okay. Though not all of them, we could be sending it to a unified namespace. We could be sending it to Hive MQ mm-hmm. and building up a unified namespace. Um, so, First, you know, we make the connections, then we start to, uh, we define standard models. So to us, a model is a series, is a name with a series of attributes. So pump, and these are all the attributes I want to collect. And then models can have models inside of them. So you can have some structure in there, though I often caution people, a lot of this, the systems that you're going to send this data to, it might be nice to be able to create these really deep and beautiful models and, you know, Everything is an object and you don't, you know, re, rename and everything else. The problem is the target system needs to be able to consume that. And in many cases, they can't. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so make sure, again, know where it's going and know the limitations of that system. So anyway, you create the model and that's the standardization of the data. Mm-hmm. Um, you map in your input data, data points. Now, if some of that data needs to be transformed in any way, you can do that. You can do that. Um, we can collect or aggregate data for a period of time and then run a calculation on it and then put it into the mapping or, or whatnot, but you map it in and then you define what we call a flow to send that data out. And okay. the flow can be either time-based. So once a second, I want to send the data. It could be on event. So when the temperature goes over this threshold or the pressure goes over this threshold or the system gets turned off or the batch is complete at this phase, I want to send this payload of data, this instance of data out to wherever it's going. And the okay. models get reused. So you create instances where you do that mm-hmm. mapping and you, you, have a, you define a pump and then you can define you know, 50 different pumps by creating 50 different instances and do the mapping and you add context in there and any transformations that you need. So um, we have lots of videos on how to use the software on our YouTube page. Um, just go to uh, YouTube, search on HiBite, um, check them out. You can see it. Um, you know, it's, we have many videos up there and they show you how the software works, get into the, 
using the software. So lots of information up there. Let John, me guess, let, look. Can I ask let one, me, one last, let, let no, me ask think, one follow-up question. Cut off. <laughs> oh, cut okay. Off just okay. A sec. I, okay. John, I just want to like clarify really quickly because we're getting a lot of comments. I want to say on the applications of, uh, yeah. of said data. The play that you're working on is essentially being the pipeline or the streamline of data, but not necessarily you're not going to come in and build out the CMS or the predictive maintenance solution or even Correct. the AI Correct. side. So the just to be clear, because I think maybe people will reach out with the with the wrong idea. And I'm familiar with the product, so I want to be uh, I want you to maybe clarify uh, kind of like which place you're, no. you're trying to add value to. I appreciate that, Val Vlad. Um, so. When we looked at the industry, we saw lots of application vendors all trying to solve industrial problems. Mm -hmm. There was the quality guys and the CMMS guys and the, um, the, uh, the uh, you know, R&D team and whoever needs access to data. They all, and then there was the dashboard guys and then the analytics teams and then the data storage and the cloud teams. And they all wanted to, you know, and, and they just kind of waved their hands when it came to getting data. But we saw lots of technology going into there. In fact, the, the innovation that I saw was there's loads of innovation in, in sensors. Mm -hmm. There's loads of innovation in networking. There's loads of innovation in cloud, in analytics, and in data storage, and in data visualization, HTML5, and blah, blah, blah. The problem was moving the data. And that's what we're solving. So as you said, we're delivering an application that allows you to establish data pipelines, essentially. The ability to establish this data is coming from these one, two, five different systems. It's merging together in this way, and it's being sent out in payloads to this target system at this rate or this frequency or this event. So, so it's the pipelining of the data. We don't do the analytics. We don't do the storage. We do have some storm forward capabilities. We do have some buffering capabilities, but it's primarily moving the data between systems. Makes sense. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, that, that, that's okay. I, I guess I was going, I wanted to ask a, a follow-up on the engineering question uh, that, that Huck had posed uh, on the, on the models. So the, the, the model of high bike, do you guys do that engineering? Do you guys have kind of that engineering department internally? Do you work through integrator partners? Do end users typically go deploy this themselves? What does the, what, what does the normal kind of path look like? And the, then what do all of the, uh, the, the abnormal paths look like to, to get yeah. this up and running? So <clears throat> Highway is a software company. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, you know, we develop the software and we work with our customers and prospects mm -hmm. on how to use the software. We don't do the engineering, this, the uh, systems integration engineering to deploy it. Um, so in some of our customers' case, they have an internal team that's just taking the software and they're running. We'll do some training. And we'll support them. We'll answer questions. We'll guide them. We'll tell them how to do different things. But we don't actually do hands-on um, implementation. Uh, yeah. If they don't have that team in place, we'll recommend system integrators. And we've worked with a number of system integrators. We'll recommend them. Um, and, and they can work with them if they don't have, you know, if they want to use cloud, they don't have cloud in place, we can recommend that as well. But we're we really focus on the software development and and uh, engineering of the product, and then look to outsiders, whether it's the customer or system integrators, primarily to uh, to deploy it and maintain it. I'm curious if I can follow up on on Dave's question a, a little bit. You know, the teams that integrate uh, data, right? Because I think. Now with the, as you mentioned, there's a lot of innovation that's happening in the space. There's a lot more data being kind of like pumped from the, these manufacturing facilities. There's a lot more newer technologies. So cloud uh, being one of them, what kind of a composition of those teams do you typically see, right? Like when you talk to a customer, does it usually right. take like a software engineer, like a process engineer that understands where it's coming from or does the actual work? Do they have like data scientists that are trying to, you know, find use cases. I'm, I'm just curious what the team dynamic looks like on the implementation side. Yeah, Dave, you look like you have an add-on question. 
No, I don't have an add on okay. question. I'm just thinking of I, I feel terrible that I didn't understand the uh, solution that you guys had more because my, my brain is just churning with with all of the different <laughs> ways that I can go use it on, on project issues that that I am currently uh, currently having. Of course. So, so please, please go uh, answer. Let me, let me answer as, Vlad's question. Yeah. yeah, you can you can turn that thread while I answer it. Um, yeah. So it's a great question, uh, Vlad. So so the interesting thing about our situation is. Um, the end user of the high bad intelligence hub is generally the OT team because the, the only people that can contextualize and standardize that data are the domain experts of the data systems. And a lot of the source data is coming out of the OT domain. So it's coming out of, could be the PLCs through an OPC server, could be you know, the historians, the SCADA system, the MBS, whatnot. So it's the people that are managing, maintaining those systems. As you guys know, there's also a lot of databases spread across manufacturing um, sites, right? There's, there's all these different um, niche bespoke databases to solve different problems or to collect different data in a manufacturing environment. So a lot of it is kind of pulling that stuff together too. Um, so that's a lot of the OT team. However, the value is gained by what we call the... Um, the, the end user is, is the, um, the, the quality team or the maintenance team or the, the business team, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes we refer to them as the line of business. So um, the people who need access to the data. And then the people that are tasked with delivering the data is the IT team. And so we find that the best projects are a combination of all three. Um, some projects don't include line of business, but the IT team has a really good handle on what line of business needs. Mm -hmm. And it's just IT and OT. We find very little success if it's just either IT or OT, yeah. because the project just gets mired in, in challenges and conflict, and it just doesn't go anywhere. The, the most success are when the IT team, and often it's, it's titles like um, solution architect and data engineer, on the IT team have been tasked with working with the OT team to figure out how we can effectively get data off of the factory floor and out of the factory systems so that they can deliver it to their line of business customers. Because really IT is, is, in my eyes, it's a service organization for the business to deliver technology, to drive the business. So, so they've been asked as a service organization, hey, we need access to this data and they don't know how to do it. And so when we can get that merger of those two disciplines, um, we can provide the technology that delivers uh, the connection of the two disciplines and, and things go really fast. When we've got one or the other, it can be challenging. Let me ask you, I guess, on that same note, do you see that you're having, I guess, like a lot of effort put into educating the customers on some of the I want to say like newer ways of uh, of doing things. I at least like pulling back from my experience have had not necessarily difficult conversations, right? But people don't always see the value or maybe are overly sensitive about going to the cloud or hey, we're, we're going to, we potentially have this data, but we don't necessarily know what to do with it. And so, you know, th there's quite of an educational side to, to this. Like, are you seeing like any bottlenecks yes. there or are you seeing them being a bit more open. I guess COVID also helped a little bit because everything's becoming more remote. And yes, uh, but what are your thoughts around that? Um, I agree. The uh, there's definitely tension, and it's different from each team. The IT team says, "Just give it to us and load it all into the data lake. Just give us mm -hmm. everything, and we'll solve the problem." <laughs> and I usually start the conversation with. There is no everything in industrial data. It's literally infinite. We have PLCs that can have over hundreds of thousands of data tags on them on a single PLC. You could have hundreds of PLCs in a factory. You could pull that data at a millisecond rate, mm -hmm. one, five, 10, if you really wanted to. So when you do the math, it's nearly infinite volumes of data. Mm -hmm. And if you jam all that into any computer, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, you will overload it in very short order. And you don't need 99% of it. So 
the comment of just send everything to the cloud and we'll figure it out up there doesn't work. And so part of educating the IT team is you don't want everything. We need to get, we need to get descriptive of what are the problems that we're solving and what data do we need to solve them? Now, you often want more than just, I need this value, this value. You know, you, you want a broad set because a lot of analytics is kind of, well, let me try this, let me try that, let me try this. But you need some core structures. You need to know, are we solving for predictive asset maintenance or SPC? Are we solving for quality? And, and then you can start to narrow down the data sets. On the OT side, you're absolutely right. A lot of the discussion you know, for many years has been around security. I can't send it up there. It, it's insecure. I don't want to lose, lose access to it. I also think that there's an unstated, if I give it to them, they're just going to ask me a bunch of questions. So I don't want them to have access to it, but I'm going to use security as kind of my, my boundary. And now I would say that five years ago, um, people wanted to go to the cloud because they thought it was cheaper and they didn't want to go to the cloud because of security. And today, I believe that's inverted. People start sending so much data to the cloud, it's got expensive. But they're also realizing that there are more and specialized security people working for these cloud vendors than they can ever have in their own company. And so actually, once we get into the cloud, it's far more secure than having it on-prem. It's going to be backed up. We're going to be able to control who has access to it much better. We have people constantly looking to see if there's any penetrations, if there's any, you know, access and whatnot. So it's interesting because, you know, that's kind of flipped on its head and you have to be very specific about what data you're putting in the cloud or else your, your bills can run up very quickly. Um, however, that said, you know, the cloud is certainly um, a cost effective solution if you're very careful with what you're putting there. Um, so I think there's resistance on both sides. And, and you know, in terms of education, um, a lot of what we're doing is education because we came out with a software product that didn't really fit. You know, a lot of people, as soon as we start talking to them, they're trying to place it in that Purdue model. Mm -hmm. Where do you fit? Are you in level one, level two, level three, level four? And educating them on, yeah, you need, those are great for applications. Uh, but you need to think about moving data separately because it, it doesn't scale and, and we need to solve other problems. And so a lot of what we do is education. And, and I think, you know, it was a lot more education four years ago than it is today, but uh, there's still a lot of education going on, definitely. I, I think that's great. I, we've got a couple of questions that I think are going to be quicker uh, on the chat. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I talked too long on some of these no, questions. No, 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 no. It, it's not a problem. This is absolutely one going to be one of those conversations that could have gone six hours. And we will, <laughs> we will at this point pre-commit to continuing this conversation with, with John and Highbyte uh, early in Q1 um, of go. next year. Uh, so, so Joyce has a question uh, specifically talking about dashboarding, right? So she wants to know if the integration team has instructions on what needs to be done to get a dashboard going uh, from, from data acquired from the sources. So I guess the, the first question, John, is does Highbyte have dashboarding capabilities or is that all done, we'll just call it in the cloud somewhere? So we don't have dashboarding. Okay. We have a, a software application to manage those pipelines. Mm -hmm. When you want to actually create a dashboard for the data, um, we would say, do it in any application you want. You mm -hmm. can write it yourself in HTML5. You can write it yourself in any other programming language. You can also use, the power of what we're doing though is you can use Tableau or Power BI mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. what I'll call commodity, low cost IT tools mm -hmm. because we're taking operational data, but we're restructuring it in a way that it's easy to use simple tools from massive companies that are delivering them across the entire you know, business scope. So, so they tend to be less expensive than your traditional OT tools. And so you know, if you need a simple dashboard, you can um, create it in Power BI or Tableau or, or other tools, Grafana. Um, or, you, or we can feed it to Ignition and you can create it in Ignition. It's really where you wanna create it. But yes, you're right, we are not a dashboarding solution. 
Okay, perfect. Uh, I appreciate it. That that was what I understood based upon our conversation. And so I, ju I just wanted to clarify, I will say yeah. I've seen lots of people use Power BI to solve these problems, especially in, in the business uh, section that, that John talked about. I would say Power BI, Tableau, depending upon where business is, it, it's a very powerful dual. I, I see, or at least I hope many, you know, uh, power users are moving away from Excel into a Power BI, so so th this should hopefully be comfortable or fairly comfortable for a bunch of those power users. And there is nearly infinite ability on what you want to build, assuming your data connections aren't on your local desktop, which they they absolutely should never be uh, when you get to this point. So I appreciate that. And then Robert. Uh, has had a bunch of uh, great questions so far. He wants to know about integration with ERP environments. Uh, do you guys integrate with SAP or other ERPs? Yeah, so we have a REST API. Most ERPs today um, have REST APIs. SAP certainly does. Um, many others do. Um, we also integrate with systems via just going straight to the database. So a lot of systems that don't have REST APIs you can interact with them via the database. So we can just mm -hmm. write um, in, or read data directly from uh, the database. So that's how we would uh, integrate with them um, today. We are looking at uh, potentially adding um, an integration directly into the SAP API, um, mm -hmm. the BAPIs. Um, that's something that, that is on our uh, roadmap and will probably be added sometime uh, next year. But uh, we have a number of customers who are using the REST API. The challenge is the customers that are using older versions um, that got pretty limited uh, if you go back very far. So. Awesome. I, I appreciate that. Vlad, I, I feel like I've once again bogarted another uh, series of questions. What, what do you got? <laughs> uh, well, I guess like to come back to the, I think like the point of data, I think maybe the questions we're getting are on the, you know, the final ways to massage the data. But again, having seen what it takes to really get the plant floor data even into a database, it is quite a challenge, right? Like, and I think like, John, we should not uh, maybe underpaint that picture because uh, again, like I want to draw like a bit from my personal experience. A lot of times you experience, let's say locks from other vendors, right? You have a standalone SCADA, the integrator is going to come in, put that solution in place, and they're going to safeguard that data, you know, in, in a similar way that you said the OT teams, but even integrators safeguard that data. So then it becomes difficult to pull from that existing quote unquote data lake. Uh, there's also challenges about contextualization. So you've mentioned this a couple of times, and I think that it's a problem that's not always understood unless you've really kind of dealt with a lot of data and you've actually dug into the databases and you've seen what it truly takes to I want to say like decipher line by line what it's what's coming in, right? And you've mentioned a couple yes. of challenges there are two. Mm -hmm. I'll let you speak in a moment, but you mentioned a couple of challenges there too, which are you know one system could probably provide that context at one point, but then as you send it to a different system, you lose that context, and at at that stage, it's very difficult to recover. It's almost like an entire integration exercise from ground up at that point. So I think. You know, maybe we're getting a lot of questions on how the data could be integrated or how it can be used. And those are also challenges. But as you've mentioned, they are to some degree solved and or are better suited for maybe for other partners. And from what I understand, you would recommend solutions that can, you know, solve those challenges. But there is a lot of challenges in just the getting the data from the plant floor into a solution that can then use them, right? So I want to like put an emphasis on that. And I think that's kind of like, that was the intent of the conversation today. So right. I want to make sure. Right. <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, to build on that, I think you're right. It's not until you get into implementing these projects that you start to realize how challenging getting the data. And it's not just getting the data for one project or one machine. Mm -hmm. It's then rolling that out at scale across an entire factory and then across an entire enterprise. So multiple factories. Um, I've, you know, we've heard statistics, different people have done different studies. 80% um, of a data scientist's time is spent finding and massaging data. And mm -hmm. only 20% is running it through their algorithms, adjusting their algorithms, rerunning it and, and, and doing something with it. Um, I've also heard um, from one of the major cloud vendors, that when they look at their projects, 
70% of the time and effort being put into the project is getting the data into the cloud in a way that it's usable rather than, I mean, they've developed all these services in the cloud, but the challenge is getting it in there. And the other challenge is, um, so, so, you know, those are two statistics that we hear a lot. Um, the other challenge is, is maintaining. And people have been implementing, all right, well, you know, we'll, we'll connect up this system to this system and we'll move this data and we'll contextualize it to whatever we need. And then we'll go over here and we'll do it for this user and we'll do it for this user and we'll move it over here and move it over there. And, and that's all good. But then over time, IT teams get overrun with maintaining those connections and not, mm -hmm. and they lose all innovation. They lose all ability to add new because they spend all their time chasing data problems. And it's, it's, I have a hole in my data. Oh yeah. Well, geez, two weeks ago, we uh, replaced that sensor, put in a new sensor. It's got new, new data points on the PLC. And we forgot to tell it because no one had any visibility that it was even using it. Mm -hmm. It was exposed over an OPC server. IT connected that up to Azure and, or, or to AWS, and they started flowing it into a data lake. And it wasn't until some report was noticed that, that we haven't got data for that for the last two months. And, and now you have a major problem. If you're a pharmaceutical and you're not collecting data, your mid device or your food, and you're not collecting data on that batch, you may have to scrap that entire batch. You may have to recall that entire batch because you don't have the data that you need for traceability. Well, we've got to the point where we need to manage and maintain all those data connections. And that, mm -hmm. that's what Highbyte's really focused on is building a solution that allows you to deploy it in the industrial environment, it generally runs on premise, and it allows you to pull data from different systems and, and send it up. You know, Think of it as data pipelines but then you can manage and maintain those pipelines. So when something goes wrong and data stops coming, you're gonna get alarms. When, <clears throat> when something is changing, it should be part of your change management process. You just go and update uh, Intelligence Hub and then you don't have the data holes anymore. And you know, you can, so you can maintain them, you can deploy new, you're very agile. Um, the needs for data, the dashboards are constantly changing. People wanna see new data. Um, all the challenges, you know, the challenges that we've had in the last couple of years, we've got, um, you know, supply chain challenges, we've had a global pandemic, we've had, we're potentially entering a recession, those all change the business dynamics of our customers. And when those business dynamics change, their metrics change, they go from being demand driven to being supply driven, or they go from, you know, really focused on how do we drive more product through to how do we cut costs? All of a sudden they want to look at different data and you need to be able to react to that really quickly. And so we're providing the tool set that allows companies to manage those data pipelines, turn them on, turn them off, uh, react to change and be highly agile. John, are there any interesting, you know, I'm always curious to hear about maybe innovative solutions or cool applications in the field. Are there any examples that you can talk about again, without mentioning anything proprietary that you've seen where people have implemented high byte or, you know, a similar data solution that allowed them to solve a problem that's, you know, maybe out of the, the usual. Um, we had one company um, who's in automotive tier one who found that their, their OEM was exposing data over REST API for uh, recalls and, and information like that. And they wanted to collect that. So, you know, there's some of that. We had another company who is a food and beverage company who, um, and Vlad, you know, if you've worked in food and beverage, you're, you're probably familiar with this. They had to do a recall and they realized that they had so little data on what batch was going where that they had to recall massive amounts mm -hmm. of product because they had, a, they had an ingredient that maybe only impacted say, a day or a week's worth of product, but they couldn't pinpoint where it went or what it went. Mm -hmm. And so they had to recall massive volumes of, of data. And so this desire for traceability and this desire for, um, you know, we're working with a, uh, the other thing, actually another innovative area that we're seeing is it's moving beyond the manufacturing floor. It's moving into AGVs. It's moving into mm -hmm. the warehouse. It's moving into the logistics. So, 
So those are kind of interesting projects where people are trying to get access to data that that has always been owned by another system. And it just kind of lived, you know, we talk about silos of, uh, of data systems in the factory, but, you know, the other industrial areas around the factory, the inbound, the outbound warehouse, they all have the same silos and people are looking to integrate those as well and leverage the tool sets that they have access to them. So that's where we're seeing um, quite a bit of activity. Interesting. And I guess like that last comment on like siloed information too, I guess that sparks up a, a question in my mind. And I think we briefly touched on it during our IIoT conversation. Are you seeing uh, more, I want to say like vendors, you know, being more open with their data or are you seeing them maybe lock in uh, their end users? So what I'm talking about primarily is I've seen a lot of in in innovation around uh, vibration sensors, right? But a lot of times they don't just open up that data. They say that, you know, they're going to control that, they're going to monitor that. So essentially, I don't know, again, I'm not going to speak to any specific vendor, but I'm assuming for something like High Byte, it would be almost impossible to extract that. I don't know if there's fees, but I'm just curious your thoughts on, you know, maybe these new custom solutions that are coming out, how open they are, or are they more closed or open in your mind? Um, so I would say it varies, but I would say, you know, from my perspective, the long term, the ones that are going to be around longer are going to be the ones that are open. And what we're seeing is customers are starting to push back on their vendors. And they're saying, mm -hmm. if you don't, you know, it's great that you can provide me an IoT platform in the cloud to manage, um, to, to access this vibration data. But um, I can't mix it with my MES data. And that's when it gets really interesting. And I don't want to push my MES data to your cloud. I want you to give me access to it in my cloud or in my, you know, in my systems. And so some of the vendors are pushing like the vibration data up to the cloud, but then they're exposing it over MQTT or REST so that we can then bring it into the customer's cloud or the customer's on-prem systems. In fact, we have one customer who, uh, who, has uses a, a, a sensor vendor, they've got fields. And so the, the sensor vendor is, is doing the backhaul of the data up into their systems. But then they're picking it up from that sensor vendor and then they're actually bringing it down on-prem and logging it into a Pi system, a Pi historian. Mm -hmm. And so they're using HiBite to pull it out of that vendor's um, systems cloud access. I believe it's over MQTT, um, could be over REST, but one of those two. And then we're pulling it down on-prem and we're publishing it into, into a Pi historian. So, you know, interesting things there. But if, if people aren't open at all, then I don't think they're going to last. I think that the, in, the, in the consumer world, um, selling the sensor and providing the IoT platform for that works. In the business world, in the commercial world, it doesn't work. And those, you know, there were a number of companies that got started and a lot of them are disappearing and I think uh, that'll continue to be the trend. The one area where I do see a lot of hosted solutions are in the lower tech uh, manufacturing environment. So, so the smaller mm -hmm. uh, discrete manufacturers, machine shops who don't have an IT team, don't have the, but wanna do a little bit of data collection and wanna do some. Similarly, food and beverage is another area. A mm -hmm. butcher shop may wanna buy a fairly sophisticated piece of equipment, but they don't have you know, the, the high end stuff. And so, they like it when the supplier of that, that equipment has, has systems in the cloud that they can go in and they can monitor and they can see how much they're using it and, and if they need to do maintenance on it. But when you get into the larger companies that have the sophistication, they need access to that data. And if, if you won't give it to them, then they're going to say, go somewhere else. We're not yeah, going to buy I, your I products. Would... I would certainly, I guess, agree with that sentiment. You know, I, I've just been in, in several battles, on, primarily on the end user side, trying to get yeah. some data, right? And it's either unaccessible completely or there's a fairly high bill, I want to say, to get access to the data. And I think you can really kind of balance that out, right? Because ultimately you can preserve your IP, but ultimately maybe provide some raw data so that, again, it can be absorbed by the end user. And maybe in your example of this uh, of a butcher shop or a smaller business, 
they can mm. use the platform as intended, but as they grow, maybe they want to use some more analytics and in which right. case they can tag into that API, which, you know, at the smaller size, they're unable to. So I, look, I, I, I think that's where the industry is going. But again, I just see a lot of instances still of uh, maybe proprietary. And again, maybe it's one of those terms that gets used as the factor to preserve that data. And maybe there's other reasons that, uh, you know, or maybe... I would say unknown to us, but at least that's the wording that I'm uh, I'm hearing. We have a no, question. There's definitely from... resistance. I agree 100% yeah. from the from the vendors. Um, and certain machine vendors, certain industries have much more resistance than others. And it's it's kind of funny when you when you see that because it's not the ones that you would anticipate. Um, you know, have the most resistance. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. And it's an interesting, like, I, I guess, dilemma from an engineering standpoint. It's almost like if, if your vendor is telling you, we're not going to open up any of the APIs yeah. and you're the end user who's trying to, you know, to some degree, you reverse engineer that machine. Mm -hmm. It almost leaves, uh, I guess the saying would be a bad taste in your mouth and you're almost trying to replace that vendor as soon as you can. Versus if they're more open to you, I'd be more than happy to buy more machines because again, being in food and Bev, <clears throat> we're not trying to build our own machinery. We're just trying right, to produce right. food. So it, it's so I, I, interesting yeah. story along those lines, Vlad. Um, so I was at an automotive conference, conference with automotive, you know, we were pitching our stuff. Um, it was all about data and IOT within automotive. And this was just uh, about six months ago. And um, I love the automotive industry. So uh you know, take this as it is. But uh, so I was in a room and they said the same thing to me. They said, you know, our vendors aren't letting us have data and we need to do something about it. And, and we can't, you know, we need to put pressure on them. And I said, you know, it's, it's interesting coming from you guys because mm -hmm. I have a car that I don't have much data on and you don't <laughs> let me get my data. I got to take it into your shop in order to get access to a yeah. very, very small sample of that data. So, you know, it was just kind of interesting because I was able to throw it back at them a little mm -hmm. bit, which, you know, is always fun um, with them because, and, and they kind of hadn't thought of that and they kind of accepted that, you know, data ownership is a major problem in the industry. And who has ownership of the data? Is it the, the machine vendor or is it the person who bought the machine? And, you know, in various uh, parts of, industry we've seen different you know that kind of that that line move so i i think those are all great points i, I will kind of summarize uh, summarize my, my thoughts on on all of that as such i wouldn't buy a data solution uh if they didn't allow me access to my data right so if everything's going to go up to a cloud and it's going to run through some proprietary algorithm they're going to give me a report but they own my data forever and i have to continue to pay them if i want to see it i just wouldn't buy it and i i would be hard pressed to recommend a client to ever invest money in something along those lines we we have certainly seen and i've certainly worked with groups that had you know maybe one plc or a series of sensors and it was not the standard of the facility. And so as part of the build, we ripped out the PLC and, and changed it over to the standard. It's it's very expensive, uh, but, but it absolutely can be done if, if that's what you want. And then I would say to the groups looking at buying these pr proprietary machines, do your research, see how much you can do to maybe not buy the proprietary machine, or maybe it's you've got to put a second series of sensors or something on it in order to get the data that you feel and find is necessary. It's not the best solution. It's not the most elegant solution, but it's important to have the data because you want it from the very beginning of owning the machine so that you can have it all the way uh all the way for the life of the machine and, and however long uh, you own the facility and enter in the industry. So I find that that is, is super important. Um, I, I would like to, to shout out Robert. Robert's got a ton of great questions and comments in here. Uh, Robert, as I said before, if we were to try to answer everything that all the questions we all have, it would be six hours. So I'm so Huck has given us a softball for you, John. So I'm going to give you the softball. We're going to go answer uh, the. We're going to go ask you kind of the normal uh, wrap up questions, uh, and uh, and we will have to continue the, this conversation um, at some point in the near future. But but Huck wants to know how do we as a community build standard data models so that we're not starting from scratch every time we try to build these contextualized or contextual pipelines. 
I would like to know that so, as well. I have the yeah. same question. That's a really good one. So um, there are some standards out there mm -hmm. um, that various industries, they generally tend to be industry focused mm -hmm. or machine type focused. Um, so um, SESME, which is a U.S. Mm -hmm. government funded organization. Um, I think it's funded out of the Department of Energy, but I could be wrong. Um, is trying is is trying to kind of assemble a large data catalog, data model catalog in the cloud, um, and trying to do some of that. Um, MT Connect was a is an industrial standard in the um, machine um, tooling world that uh, that um, had not only just the protocol, and in fact, the protocol was minor, but the semantic definitions of different types of machines and how we should define them and um, whatnot. We see it in other industries as well. Um, the OPC Foundation has tried to consolidate a lot of those and leverage the OPC um, technology as the protocol and let the different industry organizations define the semantic uh, model definition. So if you go to OPC Foundation and just look at all of their, um, oh, I forget what they call them, their, um, their kind of merger specs, I, I forget mm -hmm. the name of them. Um, they, they can, that can kind of guide you to a lot of like globally who the major players are in um, data semantic definitions in, in industrial. Um, so there's a lot of that that goes on. I'll also say though, that a lot of the contextualization and organization of data is specific for the need that it is. Mm -hmm. And it's unique to the factory. And just as we've never had a standard MES that has, that has permeated our industry and the MES is, is really fragmented because each one does really good at one niche industry, but not good at, at a wide area. Um, data standard or data usage also is, you know, there's some level of the machine should produce some standard data set, but you still need to do some transformations because that source data, some of it's coming from the machine, some of it's coming from the MES, some of it's coming from the machines all around it. And you'll never be able to assemble, have something that just, well, I don't believe that intelligently knows I'm going to pull this data, this data, this data, this data, and we're going to combine it all from these three different systems in order to deliver, um, to deliver, you know, your quality uh, payload. On the other hand, if we could standardize the source data, it would make all of our lives a heck of a lot easier. So um, we're all in favor of standardizing the machine data. And like I said, there are some good organizations out there trying to do it. Um, and there are some people that are on board and some companies that are, aren't. But, you know, industrial automation, PLCs are just so flexible that they've given everyone, you know, a rope, a rope to, uh, to um, work with and, yep. and in some cases to really cause problems with. So. No, I, I absolutely. I, I think that, that those are all good directions. And, and I think uh, everyone in industry who understands this, this is the direction we need to go. Uh, we, we've all got our work cut out for us uh, to, to help make the future better than what the last 30 years of uh, of different naming conventions uh, from PLC to PLC and, and tag to tag on upward. So so I, I appreciate that, John. Um, now, I, now, Huck was laughing because it maybe wasn't the, the best softball question in the world, but I, I, I want to kind of transition the, the, the now into the future. So I, I, I warned you I was going to ask you to predict the future. What, what, do, what does the future of, of industrial data look like? So I'm going to start, as I told you, where we start our, our projects, which is where is data going? Mm -hmm. And I believe um, that the world of technology is very much a services oriented world. And we're going to have persona or function based applications. Mm -hmm. So a a quality engineer or an R&D engineer can only handle so many, any persona can only handle so many applications. So we need to have application focused application. And so they become services as opposed to monoliths. So the world of a monolithic ERP, I think is as an ERP that's there, but in the industrial space and the use of data, 
every different person is going to have different systems that they're using. And so we need to be able, we need to recognize that and realize that we need to deliver data. Um, it's going to be sourced edge to cloud and it needs to be delivered edge to cloud, edge to mm -hmm. data center to cloud, wherever the people are, wherever the functions are. It could be an analytic that's running at the edge. We're going to be buying analytics from the machine vendor, from a system integrator, from a, a brilliant scientist who lives in the middle of Africa or South America or someplace that we never thought of, or our own team. We're going to have analytics running that are sourced from multiple different uh, companies running that, you know, all over. So as a result, in my eyes, the, the challenge is the data fabric. The challenge is the data delivery and the manage and maintenance of that. Um, that's where we're playing. That's where we see the big opportunity. Um, it's kind of like 20, 25 years ago. Um, you'll recall the value of the network that came out of 3Com. I don't know if Dave, you might remember, Vlad, you may remember 3Com from many years ago. They were a networking company, competed with Cisco. Mm -hmm. they, they had a guy that said that the, the value of the network grows based on the square of the number of nodes. And so, right. you know, similarly in data and applications, the number of applications, the value of delivering the data increases based on the square of the number of nodes of applications and, and sources of data. So if you have a lot of targets and a lot of sources, the value is all in the network of the data, not the actual end application. So, you know, we're really focused on delivering that data and delivering the infrastructure um, for companies to manage and maintain that. So. That's where we see the market going. We see the need for data is always going to be increasing. Um, the need for good data, usable data is always going to be increasing. Certainly cloud is, is, is highly relevant and is mm -hmm. being widely used. Even when people are going to be using analytics and data on-prem, I believe orchestration of those analytics is going to be from the cloud. Orchestration, okay. delivery of applications will be from the cloud, even if you're running them on-prem. So the cloud will be, it will be running a lot of stuff, but it'll also be the massive orchestrator. But a lot of analytics, a lot of data delivery, a lot of systems will be still running on-prem, but they'll all be managed and maintained through the cloud. So cloud will be there for a long time. So I think, you know, it's all about data infrastructure. And uh, of course, I'm a little jaded. That's where I come from. That's what I think about all day, every day. But um, I think uh, the need for data is, is just increasing. No, I, I, I think everyone on this side of the, uh, of the screen of Vlad and I both agree with you <laughs> that, that the, the future will be data driven. Without data, we can only get so much out of our, our machines and our facilities and, and everything else along that line. Without data, we're going to have six months worth of recalls because we don't know when our tiny little batch of, of whatever ran through the line. And I, I've lived I've lived that side where we had uh, not insignificant projects occur because, hey, we've got to go recall six months of things or we got to go hand check six to eight weeks worth of product because we had an issue. We don't know when the issue started. We don't know when the issue stopped. So we're literally pulling everything in from the warehouse and and reworking you know i don't know a quarter of the year's worth of uh product which is never inexpensive or easy so so we certainly appreciate uh th that john um beyond that uh we know that you you listen to some podcasts we would love a content recommendation so if they haven't heard enough of us talking when, when they've listened through all the backlog of Manufacturing Hub, if they haven't gotten enough after checking the High Butt YouTube channel and watching all of those, uh, all of that information, who, who should they check out? What do you uh, What do you listen to when you're not uh, doing these yourself? Yeah, I I do tend to listen to a lot of podcasts, and I have even more of them on my phone um, that I kind of scroll through and look for what what are some good topics. So a couple that I you know look at. Um, obviously yours, Manufacturing Hub, um, Ford Auto Solutions, they've got some great content that they produce. Um, a little bit further, more on the business side, Momenta um, is a venture capital firm okay. that, um, but interviews, does a lot in the industrial space, interviews a lot of leaders, both customer leaders, as well as leaders of, of companies, software companies, um, technology companies. Um, if I were to step a little bit further out of that, mm -hmm. um, how I built this, I love it. You know, it's a fascinating guy, guy Raz, I believe. Okay. Um, a little bit more on the business side marketplace. And then uh, I'll give you one 
kind of really out there podcast is Modern War Institute. And, you know, with everything that's going on in Ukraine, I, I heard about this and it's um, done out of West Point, though it's really fascinating to just listen to. They talk a lot about technology and data um, as it pertains to, to um, the military. And so they have some interesting stuff too. That, that is interesting. We always appreciate a wide variety of, of things to listen to. Vlad and I have got some listening as we've got some thinking to do. I will <laughs> say, I think that's an interesting uh, comment about Momenta, uh, the, the, the podcast from the venture capital firm. I will throw out uh, Heavy Hitters, uh, the digital industrial podcast, uh, another venture cap, another industrial focused VC firm. I've had conversations with the managing partner, Ty, who does all of the interviews similar into this space, some of them from founders growing up, some of them from, from end user side. So uh, a very uh, relevant and potentially interesting uh, podcast for you. So we, we appreciate uh, that. Our our phones will be spending the rest of the evening both downloading and, and streaming <laughs> podcasts, as I imagine a few dozen other people's will. Uh, so we certainly appreciate that. Um, beyond that, uh, we, we want some career advice, right? So, so you, you've certainly had kind of a wild ride of a career, as you were telling us that the better part of, of an hour ago. So looking at where you are now, if someone is early mid-career, perhaps looking to get into the data side of, of industrial automation, of manufacturing, what are your recommendations? Would you follow the path? Should they follow the path that, that you followed? Uh, would you suggest something uh, completely different? Um. So, you know, I think in terms of career advice, you have to follow something that you're passionate about and you're excited about, because mm -hmm. if you're not interested in listening to podcasts while you're doing your chores on the weekend or while you're, you know, exercising or something else um, about, about what, you know, what you do for work, or you're not interested in reading magazines or reading online literature and whatnot, then, um, it becomes a challenge. So I always say pick stuff that you're interested in and, uh, you know, understand there, in my eyes, there are two key things that you need to understand. Of course, I come at it from product management. That's what, mm -hmm. how we started here. Um, you need to understand the customer's challenges and you need to understand technology. And I am constantly trying to learn more on both of those. And as you guide your career, you can start your career in a manufacturer Mm -hmm. or you could start your career in technology. But if you cross paths a couple different times through your career, I think you're in a really good spot to be able to select companies that you want to work for. Because whether it's a technology company or a manufacturing company, you can then ask questions, you can then drill in, you can understand what they want to do. Um, but, you know, you know a lot more. But, you know, technology is changing the world. You need to understand technology and you need to love it. Um, and, you know, the other, I guess the last thing is just always be learning. You, you know, we're constantly learning. We're constantly, you know, you got to be curious and you got to be interested in learning because it's, it's changing fast and it's changing fast for everyone. So understand the customer of the technology, whether you're working, whether you are the customer or whether you're the technology side and understand the technology is, is kind of where, where I think it's at. No, awesome. I, I think that, that that is fantastic. Thank you, John. And last question for you is, is, is generally who should reach out? Who do you want to connect with? What do your end users look like? But I'm going to make a slight modification of that. So after you're done talking to Vlad and I all about, about all this, who uh, should reach out? Uh, who, who do you want to talk to? What are your customers? Are you guys hiring? Kind of th this is your opportunity to ask the, the community anything that you guys are looking for. Oh, um, you know, we're always, first thing, we have a lot of information that's already available for people. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a lot of information on our website. We're very open with information. We try, we try to be very content, you know, producing a lot of content. We have a blog, we've got white papers, mm -hmm. uh, we've got articles that we've written. Um, we've got a lot of content on YouTube. Um, so you can learn a lot about high by, by visiting that content. Certainly mm -hmm. if you're a system integrator or you're an end user, um, who's, you know, would like to check out the software, reach out to us. Um, I guess, it is, uh, one other thing, we have a lot of activity on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is one of the key, uh, activity sources for us, um, where we're posting a lot of things and we interact with a lot of people. So, you know, subscribe to our LinkedIn um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, you know, and it will, will, 
you know, we like, we like talking about data. We like talking about data challenges. We mm-hmm. like solving challenges for companies. Um, anyone who, you know, if you're working at a large manufacturer, uh, this stuff interests you. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to understand your challenges. We'd love to, you know, see if we can, if we have a good fit for you. And uh, if so, um, you know, you can perform a trial and, and see if it fits and see what it can do. Um, if you're looking for a job, we often have a lot of job listings. The company's growing. We've been pretty much doubling in size for the last four years. Um, we, uh, you know, so reach out to us. Um, just monitor our, our website. Um, if you have a unique uh, skill set in, you know, software development, sales, marketing, you know, in technology products, you know, that, that's where our focus is. Um, if we don't have a listing today, we may have one up tomorrow or the first of the year. Or so, so, you know, keep checking back or reach out to us, you know, send us a letter. Don't send us a letter that says, Hey, I want to work for your company. Here's my resume. Send us a letter that says, Hey, I want to work for your company. This is why, this is why I'm passionate about data. This is why I'm passionate about data for industrial. And this is what I think I can do for your company. And those are the ones that get looked at. So, um, you know, love to talk to anyone who's, who's passionate about these things. No, th- th- that is amazing. Uh, again, thank you so much, John. Thank you, everyone, for, for hanging out uh, as long as you had. Uh, if we have not gotten to your questions or comments, uh, we will absolutely get back to, uh, to you guys. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. I will say if you guys have made it this long, please go ahead and feel free to hit the follow and subscribe buttons to myself and Vlad and John uh, for for Manufacturing Hub. If we are listening in uh, podcast format, please hit the subscribe button and rate us five stars and and go hit the the follow so that it continues to download every Thursday at some point when we get it posted. Uh, that, That super helps. And I have found that when I remember to ask people to download and subscribe, we get more downloads and subscribes. And I've noticed that when I don't ask, uh, we get less downloads and subscribes. So uh, thank you all for doing that. Uh, Again, Vlad and I will see you next Wednesday um, and we'll see everyone soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and and I would just say if if someone, you know, has questions, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn and, uh, you know, reach out on LinkedIn and and ask questions. I'm happy to to answer them. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate it. Great stuff. Thank you very much, guys. And have a happy holidays if I don't talk to you before then. Will do. Thank you.